This is Kick-Ass Politics. I'm Ben Mathis. Hey, folks, just a quick announcement. We're in the midst of a very important fundraising drive to come up with all of our production costs for 2016. If you like Kick-Ass Politics and you value what I'm doing here, then I hope you'll go to GoFundMe.com backslash Kick-Ass Politics and donate what you can. It's vital that we fund our production budget for the coming year so I can focus my energies on the content side of Kick-Ass Politics and keep producing new episodes for you every week. So be a part of what I'm creating here. Just go to GoFundMe.com backslash Kick-Ass Politics or hit the donate button on our webpage at KickAssPolitics.com. Thanks in advance, folks, and now enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Ben Mathis, and welcome to Kick-Ass Politics. If you've been listening to the presidential debates over the past several months, you might think that the biggest threat to the U.S. homeland will come from ISIS or al-Qaeda-trained militants sneaking across our southern border and waging violent jihad on innocent Americans. Is that a possibility? Yes. Is it a concern? Absolutely. But the greater danger may very well come from a threat much closer to home. In the 15 and a half years since the 9-11 attacks, 36 people have been arrested or killed for successfully perpetrating terrorist attacks on U.S. soil. These include the 2001 anthrax attacks, the 2002 Beltway snipers, the shootings at Fort Dix and Fort Hood, the Boston Marathon bombing, all the way up to the recent San Bernardino attacks. Of the 36 terrorists behind these attacks, three of them either had a permanent green card or were here on visas awaiting their permanent green card, four were naturalized citizens, that means that they were born somewhere else but became U.S. citizens, and 29 of the 36 terrorists were U.S. citizens born and raised right here in America. It's worth noting that not one of them had entered the country illegally. While the media and politicians largely focus on the terrorist threat from overseas, a far greater threat could be brewing right here under our very noses. The Homeland Security Department and the FBI have become increasingly worried about the danger of so-called self-radicalizing terrorists born right here in America with access to sophisticated propaganda and detailed instructions readily available online from the media arm of groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. But this increased focus on homegrown threats has also sparked debates about domestic surveillance of U.S. citizens and potential government overreach in an age of hypervigilance, all of which speak to larger questions involving what separates mental illness from terrorist intent what constitutes a terrorist attack, where First Amendment rights come into play, and what kind of conversations Islamic leaders in the U.S. need to be having with young Muslim men. My guest today explores all of those issues in his new documentary called Homegrown, The Counterterrorism Dilemma. He's award-winning filmmaker Greg Barker, who began his career as a freelance journalist and a war correspondent working with networks like CNN, the BBC, and Reuters. He then made a string of documentaries for PBS Frontline, including the acclaimed film Ghosts of Rwanda. He's since gone on to direct and produce feature-length documentaries for HBO, including Sergio, Koran by Heart, and Manhunt, the untold story of the hunt for bin Laden for which he won an Emmy Award for Outstanding Documentary or Nonfiction Special. His newest film, Homegrown, The Counterterrorism Dilemma, premieres tonight, February 8th, at 9 p.m. Eastern on HBO. And today, he's on the show to talk about that dilemma and the many complicated aspects of domestic terrorism. Coming up in just a moment with my guest, filmmaker Greg Barker. Holly. 
Hollywood to Washington, it's time for Kick-Ass Politics. And now here's your host, Ben Mathis. Today I have in studio with me Emmy Award winning filmmaker Greg Barker. He has a new documentary premiering on HBO tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern called Homegrown, The Counterterrorism Dilemma. Greg, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Um, you won an Emmy for your previous documentary for HBO called Manhunt, the inside story of the hunt for bin Laden. Is Homegrown intended to be a companion piece to Manhunt? It is, actually. Yeah, it, it uh, in many ways, it picks up where Manhunt left off. Um, Manhunt was the, yeah, the story of the hunt for bin Laden. Um, and this really is about you know, taking that the the same counterterrorism machine that was put in place after nine eleven to combat Al Qaeda overseas, and saying, okay, what happened when that machine shifted its focus um, to the to the domestic threat here at home, and that's really what plays out in this film. Yeah, and first I watched Homegrown, and then the second night I watched Homegrown and Manhunt together, and what was interesting for me was to watch. You know, the pre-9-11 of, you know, you have these uh, a number of counterterrorism CIA analysts talking about how before 9-11, they were so frustrated because the higher ups weren't taking al-Qaeda seriously. They weren't connecting the dots. They didn't have enough resources dedicated to bin Laden. And then now you go fast forward 16 or 20 years um, and you have this new film where it's the completely the other side of that. Uh, you know, we're through the looking glass now and we have, we're hyper alert. We have this huge intelligence bureaucracy. We have all kinds of new avenues for obtaining data. Uh, so my, I guess my question would be, has the pendulum swung to the point where we're now overdoing it? Or are we at the point where we finally caught up and we're just now starting to get it right? Well, I think, th you know, that's a, that's a debate that, um, in my opinion, it's we've kind of swung. It's, we're overdoing it a bit, particularly with regard to the domestic threat. Um, we have built up a massive counterterrorism uh, apparatus inside this country, and I think if you look at the statistics, um, the threat is is kind of not on the scale of the of the of the bureaucracy that's been built up. Now, partly it's because the bureaucracy has been effective. Um, and, you know, if you are, you know, we, we don't, they don't catch everybody, obviously, look at San Bernardino, but, but the, the web of intelligence gathering and um, counter um, terrorism operations that are in place in this country is, 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 is massive. I mean, I think it's safe to say that when you look at what happened in Paris with those attacks, the involvement of those people and the track record of the previous track record of the perpetrators, they would very likely have been watched extremely closely in this country. And it's unlikely that something of that scale with those kinds of perpetrators would have would have ever gotten to that stage inside this country. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's great, right? So but at the same time, have we have we built something that's gotten too big? And what's happened, I mean, it's very understandable is you have um, uh, massive bureaucracy entire careers, large budget, budgets that have been put in place um, since 9-11 to combat terrorism inside this country. And people's lives are wrapped up in that now. Um, political careers are wrapped up in it. It's very difficult to say, actually, this is a problem that is largely being managed and managed effectively, because politically, that's, that's, that's you know, there's no upside to saying that for politicians. And yet right. a lot of people inside the bureaucracy told me that that's how they feel. Yeah, because you do talk to uh, former agents with the FBI and CIA who are very high up in the process um, as far as counterintelligence and trying to track down homegrown terrorists. And even they admit that psychologically, terrorism is a huge, a huge boogeyman in America. And it is a, a real threat, and we need to treat it like that. But in terms of perspective, we should probably be talking about drunk driving as much or more as we're talking about terrorism or dedicating as many resources to that. Yeah, I mean, th that's right. Those kinds of, um, you know, drunk driving, gun violence, gangs, obesity cause a lot more deaths in this country now than, than terrorism does by far. But I think, you know, we have to remember that 9-11 was a huge psychological uh, shock to this country. And just as you were talking about in my previous film, Manhunt, where we 
talked to a lot of the CIA analysts who saw the bin Laden, the threat from al-Qaeda, long before anybody else, and nobody listened to them. Well, the pendulum has really swung in the other direction now. Now we're hyper-vigilant against, against the threat that is, is nowhere on the scale, I think, of, uh, of, of what happened then. I mean, the, 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 you know, we never know what could happen, but the chances of a 9-11-style attack happening in this country now are you know, extremely small, much less than they were before 9-11. Well, you do cover both sides of the issue here because you talk to, like I said, the intelligence agents who are tasked with stopping another attack, but you also talk with the family members of some of the young Muslim men who either pulled off an attack or were convicted of planning an attack or convicted of providing material support to terrorism, which may not necessarily be the same as planning to commit an act of terrorism. What constitutes providing material support to terrorism? Well, it can actually be, um, uh, in, in the case of one of the young men in this film, it was uh, sending some videos, communicating and then sending videos of uh, landmarks in Washington, D.C., kind of that might be a potential. It was in, these videos were interpreted to be, you know, casing out potential targets. But it can also be, you know, if 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 somebody wants to go travel to, Syria, with the intent of living in the Islamic State, mm -hmm. not a state of intent of not not wanting to necessarily fight with ISIS, but simply living there, that is enough to to be charged with material support. And the material support in that yeah. case is the person's is the person's self, their body that is providing material support to a terrorist entity, ISIS. So it's a very broad category. Um, that's used extremely effectively in these in these cases, and it's it's. I mean, I think if you're if you are charged with any kind of terrorism related offense in this country, you have a ninety nine percent chance of getting convicted. You talk about the case of Shifa Siddiqui. Uh, you talk to his sisters, and you also talk to the FBI agent who was on that case, and the prosecutor who caught him and put him behind bars. He's now serving seventeen years in federal prison. What were the details of his case? Well, he was. Um, a young uh, American um, born in uh, Atlanta from a family that was originally from Bangladesh and um, had a normal sort of upbringing in the suburbs. Um, and when he was a teenager, um, got involved with some online activity um, and came on the FBI's radar because he and a, uh, a friend of his started, you know, making contacts with uh, with people who had identified themselves as, as terrorists. And um, he was, you know, eventually traveled to, to Canada to meet some people who were later convicted in Canada. He and his friend went to Washington and made what I referred to before as these sort of casing videos of targets in Washington, D.C., or monuments, that, and then sent those videos overseas to people who identified themselves as terrorists and were already on the FBI's radar. It was that, that those... That, that action, that was one of the charges uh, brought up against him. Now, this, this, you know, on the flip side, I spent a lot of time with the family. This kid was 17, 18 years old. Uh, he never actually, um, as far as we know, sort of planned an actual attack. He was clearly interested in, in the idea of jihad, devoted a lot of time to translating texts from Arabic, into English and then disseminating disseminating those on the on the internet. He was very sort of just fluent in both English and, and Arabic, and he and that's what he that's how he used his, his intellect was uh, translating these texts, and that was seen to be as evidence of his of, of, of certain intent as well. So, in the end, he was uh, he went to Bangladesh, got married, and then was was essentially um, kidnapped by uh, the Bangladeshi authorities. And turned over to the U.S. government, brought back to the U.S. It was a, a rendition. Brought back to the U.S. and then charged um, in federal court with um, material support for to, to pr providing material support for a terrorist organization. Now the FBI people say that he was on the verge of planning uh, a violent act inside the U.S. Uh, his family says he did nothing wrong, and um, and then once he was brought into custody, he was then held for um, uh, in solitary confinement before being formally charged in court uh, for three and a half years. 
and then wow. eventually was tried and found guilty and is now serving a sentence. Yeah, why did they need to hold him for three and a half years before actually taking it to trial? I mean, that's a very good question. Hmm. Very good question. Just because, because they could? I mean, that yes. I mean, and now that's a decision that was made by the by the um, by the, the the federal penitentiary. I mean, not the FBI necessarily, or the you know, or the counterterrorism people. Once they enter, but once these people enter the criminal justice system, and then then, you know, often they're treated differently than other other. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was he had did not have a violent background. He was, mm -hmm. you know, it was, and in the end, he, he was kind of going. His family says it himself, kind of going insane in 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 prison while he was held in solitary as a nineteen year old kid. You know, so yeah. I mean, there's really no good explanation for that, and I um and. He, other than he was a potential, you know, they saw him as a potential terrorist. And I'm curious why they let him escape the country and then had to go through all this trouble to rendition him from Bangladesh rather than just arresting him here in the U.S. If, if we're worried about the threat on the homeland, that's something that didn't quite make sense to me. Yeah, I mean, it's it doesn't entirely make sense. I mean, they were tracking, this is often what happens, they were tracking these guys for a long time. Um, and what they're trying to do is to see who else they're linking up with so that mm, they get a okay. full picture of the network that they might be involved with, you know? Because once they take down somebody, then everyone's aware that they're being tracked. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think, um, but could they have arrested him in the U.S.? They had plenty of evidence. I mean, all the evidence that was presented in this trial, they gathered while he was in the U.S., so they could have certainly stopped him earlier. He went off, got married. They must have decided... There was a reason to let him go travel, and then at some point they decided while he was in Bangladesh that it was too risky to leave him out there overseas because he might mm. suddenly disappear. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, and you talked to his sisters who live in Atlanta, and I'll admit I, I sympathize with them as a family member the same way I would with the family members of the Columbine shooters. Any family that has to deal with something like this, it's, it's definitely it's disturbing and it's tragic for them. But when I start to listen to them, I get a little bit angry, I'll be perfectly honest, from my perspective, because you talk to the agents, you lay out the case against them. They're communicating with known terrorists. They're going to Canada to meet with known terrorists, doing these casing videos in Washington. They're passing the Pentagon saying, Alu Akbar, that's where our brothers took down the Pentagon. They're videotaping non-tourist sites, the Department of Energy and security kiosks at all these locations. It seems to me common sense. You put two and two together, you know what his intent is here. And yet the sisters are saying, oh, when he was a boy, he wouldn't even hurt a bug and he's so harmless. And they just seem to not see this at all. Well, I mean, they're not here. So, I mean, I spent a lot of time with them and... <laughs> right. um, what they would say is that, I mean, I think they would say that a lot of his actions were concerning. And uh, had they known what he was actually doing, um, they both say they would have stopped him or tried to intervene or they, it was, you know, they didn't know. And, uh, but what they would say and what his lawyers would say is that everything that he was doing could be explained by, um, you know, or, 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 you know, comes under the category of free speech. I mean, it is not illegal. I mean, it, right. it, it can That's be true. illegal, as one of his lawyers says. If you're 17 or 18, do you sit, with, talk, sit down with your buddy and, and say, well, you know what, let's go rob a bank. Uh, and you make a plan, kind of just give it over a couple of beers to rob a bank. That is illegal, and that is a conspiracy because right. you've made a plan. Um, but the chances of being prosecuted for that are extremely slim. If you and I say, hey, let's go you know, commit this act, you know, let's go bomb this building in the name of jihad, and somebody hears about it, we're going to get convicted. And, 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 and so it's a different kind of, these cases are treated differently. And so what they would say is, as concerning as what he was doing, he never actually, you know, he never got a bomb. He never actually took steps to attack something. Um, on, and had, they would say, had we known about it, we would have, we would have tried, to, tried to stop him. Now, the FBI would say, we're not going to tell family members because we have to, as I said before, we have to track this web. Yeah. And uh, we don't want to intervene until we've gathered you know, all of the, you know, until, until we kind of own this entire web and can take it all down. This is why the film is called The Counter Terror Dilemma. You, I try to sort yeah. of present both sides, but I understand. I mean, people can be frustrated with, with their perspective. Well, yeah. And the, the, the sisters keep saying things like, 
I thought committing terrorism is committing an act of terrorism. He didn't commit an act of terrorism. So what are we supposed to just wait around? I mean, that's what the whole point is that we don't want another 9-11. But well, yes, I, yes. It's frustrating. I mean, it is frustrating. <laughs> and there are a number of cases where, you know, there have been um, government informants, FBI informants who have sought out people who, you know, there's one case up in the Bay Area of a guy who was um, basically a schizophrenic who, you know, started talking about jihad, converted to Islam, and they, the government inserted a, an informant to work with him. And, you know, they, he, they presented ideas of maybe you want to do this, this, this. And he's like, okay. And then they're, you know, then he was convicted. Now he's, his life is ruined. I mean, there's a lot of, there, there's huge potential for misuse of government power here. And that's something that, you know, under the name of counterterrorism. And that's something I think, you know, we have to be vigilant about. But at the same time, that there are also there are also real cases, and um, you know it's tricky to know exactly how to how to proceed on them. But the, what the families would say is that is that um, uh, there's just government overreach. But we present both sides in the film, and it's interesting when we when you sort of we show the film to audiences and we poll them, and I'll say, do you think the government was right to take down to put you know go after Chief of Siddiqui and and put him in jail, it's pretty evenly split. In hmm. like Washington, D.C., about 60% thought the government was right. New York, about 40%. We had a screening in L.A. Um, the other night, about, you know, about half and half, really. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, you know, and I, I think what I try to do is to present these different faces, faces of America. We have this imperative to stop terrorist threats. We also have a community that largely feels under under siege and um, and victimized in a way that they you know that they shouldn't be. Now it's a subject for debate, and that's what we try to get into. You know, we're going to take a quick break, and then I'll be back to talk more with Greg Barker about his film Homegrown. If you're enjoying my conversation with Greg Barker about his new film Homegrown, I think you'd be interested in the book that inspired his movie called The United States of Jihad, Investigating America's Homegrown Terrorists, by author Peter Bergen. And right now, you can download the audio version of this book for free with a special promotion for our listeners from audible.com. Just go to audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics for a free 30-day trial and a free audiobook download, which can be The United States of Jihad, or any of Audible's 180,000 titles for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, iPad, or MP3 player. That's audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or click on the sponsor link on our webpage to download the free audiobook of your choice. And now, back to the show. We're back, and I'm talking with Greg Barker, the director of Homegrown, which debuts on HBO at 9 p.m. tonight. It's interesting that you bring up the, the mental health dimension to this, because in the film you talk to an imam in Chicago who is very active in trying to rescue these young men from going too far off the cliff and getting involved in uh, radical Islam and terrorism. Um, and he talks about Samir Khan, who was a young Minnesota man who ran away and joined Al-Qaeda, and he was killed in a drone strike. And he talks about how this young man joined Al-Qaeda really because he was depressed over a failed relationship, and he was just young and confused and mentally unstable. He also talked to the cousin of the Fort Hood shooter, Major Nadal Hassan, uh, and also to Philip Mudd, who was with the FBI Terrorism Task Force, and they both agree that the case of Nadal Hassan was a mental health situation, not necessarily Islamic terrorism. So where do you draw the line between a mental health problem, such as, say, the Columbine shooters or workplace violence, someone, quote unquote, going postal, and deliberate Islamic terrorism? Yeah, I think you have to look at political intent, I mean, is my opinion. is that So if you go back and think of Osama bin Laden or Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who planned 9-11 with bin Laden. These are political terrorists, right, who had a whole philosophy that, um, that was grounded in their faith as they interpreted it and, and the political reality in their region, the Middle East, and they 
the, the, they concluded that the way to achieve their ends, both religiously and politically, was to use to, to, was to use acts of terror. I mean, that is traditional terrorism in the sense that it has been used by other groups over time um, to achieve political aims. That's what bin Laden was about. He had a whole theory around it. A lot of the cases we're seeing now are really are not at that level of, of uh, excuse the term, but intellect. You know, bin Laden was a smart guy even though he was deranged. But these are people who are often looking for a, a way to belong. I mean, it's, if you want to you know, make the analogy to like in other communities, people who might join gangs or get involved in drugs or join a cult, you know, people who somehow are, are missing something in their life, maybe it's a family situation, a society, I don't know who, they're angry about something. And, and this version of jihad gives them a... Uh, a path to join something that's bigger than themselves. In the case of Samir Khan, you know, he was a kid in, in North Carolina, kind of, you know, an average kid, um, kind of nerdy kid, and um, started making a name for himself by, by putting out jihadi propaganda in English. He was the first real propagandist in English of uh, bin Laden's ideas, al-Qaeda's ideas. Previously, they'd all been in Arabic. And he was doing this openly in North Carolina, always staying just on the edge of the First Amendment. He actually consulted a lawyer to figure out what can I say that's not going to, you know, that takes me right up to the First Amendment freedom, and, but without sort of getting charged. And eventually he got more frustrated. And as we tell, unpack in the film, a lot of it had to do with this failed relationship with a girl. And he was, he was kind of a lost kid. And he found meaning in this, in, in the idea of jihad. And then eventually he goes off to Yemen and uh, joins the Al Qaeda affiliate there and founds you know uh, this infamous magazine called Inspire, which basically is the first English language online magazine for jihad that has lots of instructions on how to build bombs and how to attack the, the West and and it's still used um, by prospective jihadis you know or uh, in English speaking countries so you know. And then he eventually was killed in a in a drone strike. He wasn't targeted. He just happened to be there when another American, Anwar Alaki, was was killed in a drone strike. But um, but he his path was just like a lost kid. He wasn't. He did not begin as as this as as a you know, for lack of a better word, as somebody with a with a political idea and a political objective that that combined it with ideology and then concluded, okay, we have to we have to. Um, use terrorism to achieve our ends. He was just a lost soul who went down this path. And you see a lot of guys like that, whether it's mental health, health issues or like guys and women, or just they don't belong. And this is a way that they might make, make, them, make themselves feel like they're part of something else. Yeah, and even uh, the FBI agent, Philip Mudd, uh, talks about these kids that they're investigating and he wants to be able to just call them up and say, what are you doing with your lives? You know, these are young men who are confused and angry and, you know, have a lot of things going through their brain. And sometimes, you know, an 18-year-old boy can go to a pretty dark place. Yeah, I was just, I was just thinking that um, I was talking to a defense attorney who deals with a lot of these cases of kids who are charged with joining ISIS and wanting to join ISIS. And um, he had actually been a, a federal prosecutor, this guy's in Chicago, um, um, you know, 20 years ago, and he he's of Irish descent, Thomas Birkin. He said to me, he's like, look, back in the day when the IRA was a problem in, in Ireland, if there was like Irish kids in this country who wanted to go off and join the IRA and the FBI found out about it, they would go in and talk to the parents and, uh, and sort of say, look, you know, this is what's going on with your kid. And, um, and the problem was sorted out that way. You know, they weren't charged. That does not happen now. Very rarely does that happen. Um, and uh, um, that's partly because, um, uh, as I said before, they want to kind of investigate the full web. But also it's just, it's just very politically difficult to, for any sort of single um, government officer to say, look, maybe we shouldn't you know, prosecute this. Maybe we should try to see if we can save this kid. Because what if they can't? Yeah. And then what if he commits something? But you know there is a there's a role for some kind of conversation between government and the community or the family that maybe these are often young misguided um, 
you know, kids, 17, 18, 19 year olds who, as you know, we all do crazy things when we're, when we're that young. Since you brought that up, in my mind, one of the real heroes of this story is an a mom and a professor or a counselor, I forget, at Loyola University in Chicago yeah. named Omer Mozafar. And you see him sitting down with these young people in the Muslim Student Association, reaching out, talking about these issues, trying to fight for the souls of these young Muslim men who may be very confused, clarifying misinterpretations of the Quran. Are there a lot of imams or moderate leaders in the U.S. Muslim community who are doing what he's doing? Because I don't hear those stories very much. Yeah, and that would, seems like what we need. I, mean, I would agree with you. I think uh, not as many as there should be. I mean, he is one of the more prominent ones. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's a fascinating guy because he actually, as a young man, as he says, tells in the film, he was intrigued by the, um, uh, by the story of the Taliban and uh, thought of joining the Taliban himself. Right. When they were, this was way back when they were fighting the Soviets. Yeah, this was before nine, yeah. This was in the nineties, before nine yeah. eleven. But they were committing atrocities in in Afghanistan, which he then found out about, and that's why he didn't. He just couldn't justify their actual actions with what he knew of Islam, and then he end, ended up going into academia. But he understands that the the mentality that can draw young men to a cause like that, partly it's romantic. You know, you go off and you're part of some great heroic cause. I mean, look at the Americans who joined, you know, up in the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. It's not, it does happen. And um, uh, so, but now what he does is he works with, with um, young men and women who, um, who might be attracted to this call of violence and call to jihad and tries to kind of correct, um, you know, and save them really. And as we tell in the film, one of his kind of one of he was a mentor to uh, Samir Khan, who ended up, you know, going off and founding Inspire Magazine and being killed. One of the most notorious, you know, um, American homegrown sort of, you know, jihadis. And um, and Omar in the film says he describes him as the one that got away, you know, because he he and and he misses him because he knew him. Their families were friends. He knew him, you know, as a young adolescent. Was just this nerdy kid, and um, and as we saw in the film, he ended up, you know, getting frustrated over a failed relationship with a girl, and didn't know where to turn, and ended up sort of falling into this this trap of jihad. And of course, it's so easy now through the internet to find this material. I mean, and we show some of the propaganda yeah. stuff in the film too. Yeah, and you talk about self radicalization. It used to be that when people joined a terrorist organization. It was through, they were radicalized by a radical imam or a friend recruited them. Now, it seems that most of these young men, they, you know, all that you need is curiosity to become a terrorist. Yeah, I mean, the material is all easy. available. It's very easy to find. And uh, the fact is, you know, you can look up jihad, you can find ISIS videos on the internet incredibly easily. Uh, the FBI, you know, does not have time to track everybody doing that. I mean, people think I, if you type the word jihad and Google, you're going to get watched. It's, that's not the way it works. Um, I think if you then take steps, you'll get on somebody's radar, hopefully. But um, but the um, the material is out there, and um, it's very easy to to access it, and you can access it in your in your bedroom. So people used to worry about, oh, there's a radical mosque down in this neighborhood, and we should. I mean, that is not the way these these things play out now. Most mosques, you know, most. People who go to mosques in this country now feel there's likely to be an FBI informant around one of the mosques. I mean, that's what mm -hmm. most American Muslims feel. Um, and uh, so you, you're not finding, you know, before 9-11, there may have been some radical mosques in this country. I think now it's much less likely. This stuff happens online and makes it a lot harder to, to track. And that brings up an interesting point that this imam in Chicago talks about. And he, he really kind of reminds me of the preachers in South Central who are trying to rescue kids from a gang. There's a lot of that similar feeling yeah. there, and I really empathize with him. But he talks about how one of the biggest impediments to anyone reaching out and seriously talking about trying to save these young men from making this huge mistake in their life is that Muslims are so paranoid even to have a discussion about ISIS or Al-Qaeda or how they feel or if they sympathize 
trusts in some ways with these people and actually work these things out because they're afraid that they might end up on a government watch list. Yes. Um, he says we need to be having these discussions with young men because if the Muslim leaders in America aren't having these discussions and aren't talking about this with them, these young men who are naturally curious are going to be informing themselves somewhere else that we may not like so much. I think, yes. And so his point would be that you just can't, that Muslim leaders can't just, you know, bury their heads in the sand and say, this isn't Islam, it's not us. And because it's not good enough for, for somebody who's curious and, uh, because they'll find they'll find that information out there, and um, and so they have to actually engage with 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 the ideology of of ISIS and other radical groups directly, and and talk it through. And so one of the things he does is he's he spends time on all the um, the Islamic chat rooms and uh, finds people who are pro ISIS, you know, tweeting and chatting away, and he'll then counter it online and sort of and point oh, really? out just like they'll they'll yeah they'll they'll quote some passages in the Quran and. He'll then go and correct it, and you know, I mean, wow. the you know, the Quran does have verses that pertain to violence. I mean, it's and and we all heard them, you know, and and but he would say if you look at them in a proper context, it doesn't mean that, and you have to look at the period of you know when this was when um, when uh, the period of time when when Islam was founded, which was a very violent time, and it's. And if you if you interpret it all in a different way, you you don't end up with the conclusion that you have to go fight, you know, fight for ISIS. Well, I know that you have to go. So before we go, and I don't intend this to be a spoiler, but you end the film with the FBI agent Philip Mudd in kind of this awkward scene where he invites the family of Shifa Zadiki to his home to have a conversation. And uh, the last words that you end the film with. He says, if you were in my shoes, what would you do? And then you cut to credits. Before we go, my question to you is, how did the family respond to that? They didn't give a direct response. Okay. Yeah, so the, the, the last scene, it kind of, it builds up to, the whole film builds up to a final scene, which was, was one of the most amazing um, moments I've ever filmed, you know, as a, in my career as a documentarian. It was an extraordinary uh, um, coming together of different parts of our society, you know, kind of the... The, the hunter and the hunted, yeah, in a way, and uh, they come together in this room, and with good intentions, and it becomes this very awkward, tense situation. I think both leave feeling like they've kind of, kind of were, you know, repelled apart and could not reach any real common ground. So it's a, which is I think kind of where we are in this country. It's a complicated um, problem. This question of terrorism. There's a lot of fear out there, where some of it's justified, and. Um, and also, but but perhaps it's being overstated, and it's a it's a difficult situation. I think we have to learn to think about it with nuance and with complexity, because I think the question of terrorism as coming out of radical Islam is going to be with us for some time, and we have to just get beyond the post nine eleven reaction to it and think about it in a more nuanced way, because it'll be with us for a long time. Yeah, and the debate will certainly go on. Well, the film is called Homegrown, The Counterterrorism Dilemma, which premieres tonight on HBO at 9 p.m. Eastern. Greg Barker, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks again to Emmy Award winning filmmaker Greg Barker for coming on the show to talk about his new documentary, Homegrown, The Counterterrorism Dilemma. It airs tonight on HBO at 9 p.m. Eastern or it's available on demand on HBO Now or HBO Go. For more information, go to hbo.com. Also, his previous film, Manhunt, The Untold Story of the Hunt for Bin Laden, is available for download at Amazon, iTunes, or HBO Now, and it makes a very interesting companion piece to Homegrown, so check that out too. Don't forget to subscribe to Kick-Ass Politics on iTunes, and while you're there, leave us a review. I'd also appreciate it if you went to our site and filled out a brief audience survey. And please recommend Kick-Ass Politics to your friends on social media. And if you really want to help out, then donate to our GoFundMe campaign at gofundme.com backslash kickasspolitics. Follow us on Twitter at KA Politics or visit Kickass Politics on Facebook. And as always, I welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at kickasspolitics.com. 
On the next podcast, I'll talk with Mark McKinnon, star of the new Showtime series, The Circus. We'll talk about his 30-year career as a political advisor and media strategist, the candidates like George W. Bush and John McCain, and what it's like to be on the outside looking in this time around, as he and his co-stars, Mark Halpern and John Heilman, follow the candidates in the 2016 presidential election for their new show, The Circus, on Showtime. Coming up in the next podcast. But for now, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass Politics. This podcast may not be reproduced without express written permission. Kick-Ass Politics is a trademark of Mathis Entertainment, Inc.